We're right at the start time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, so we'll go ahead and begin. First off, good afternoon. I'm Jason Thomas. I'm a project engineer at America Makes, and I'll be your host for today's America Makes TRX webinar series. A little background on the TRX webinar series before we introduce our speaker. Uh, as America Makes continues its mission to expand and accelerate the footprint of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, this medium called the America Makes Technical Review, Review and Exchange webinar series was created. By creating this platform, it allows the additive manufacturer and 3D printing community to come together and share knowledge and experience with a broader community. If you or your team are interested in presenting during the TRX webinar series, there will be a link to complete the request form at the end of the series today, or you can reach out to me, Jason Thomas, directly. Uh, a few important notes before we kick off the series. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for a brief Q&A session. Uh, if during the presentation you have a question for Lynn, please submit it in the Q&A space on your WebEx screen, and I'll uh, ask it during the Q&A session. I'll do my best to get all of your questions answered. So today's webinar is going to be on functionally graded lattice structure design for metal additive manufacturing. Lattice structures have been a really hot topic lately, uh, so I'm excited to see today's presentation. Uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Lynn Chang of Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Lynn is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at work at WPI. Dr. Cheng received his bachelor's degree from Zian Zhao Tong University and, and his master's degree from Shanghai, Shanghai Zhao Tong University. He holds a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Pittsburgh and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Northwestern University from 2019 to 2021. His research interests lie in physics informed deep learning and computational design for metal additive, additive manufacturing. The design optimization methods developed by him have been adopted and implemented by ANSYS and their engineering simulation software. Dr. Cheng has 23 peer reviewed journal publications in journals such as additive manufacturing, computer methods in applied mechanics, and engineering, etc. He won first place in a student poster competition at the Rapid Mechanics and Engineering. Oh, I'm sorry, at the Rapid Conference in 2017 for presenting his work on lattice infill optimization and received the, the best RA award in mechanical engineering at the University of Pittsburgh in 2018. In 2021, Dr. Chang won the fellow competitors in the, work, in the workshop New Trends and Open Challenges in Computational Mechanics from Nano to micro, Macro Scale and has been selected to present his work on physics informed deep learning for accelerating RVE analysis and data-driven microscale material identification and defect characterization. Lynn, I'll now ch turn it over to you and your team. I look forward to your presentation. All right. Thanks for your introduction, Jason. Anyone can hear me here? Is it clear for everyone? Okay, good. Yep. So, so the, thanks for your introduction, Jason. So, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Lin Chen. I'm very happy to be here to share my research for additive manufacturing. As Jason mentioned, the title of my presentation will be Functionally Graded Lattice Structure Design for Metal AM. Basically, this research topic is uh, funded by the American Mix. So I'm very happy to be here to make the presentation and give this introduction. So for today's presentation, I will cover three subtopics. First, I will uh, discuss a design methodology called functional graded lattice structure inflow of matter for AM. By using this method, it allows us to simultaneously optimize for performance and weight and provide naturally internal support for AM. Basically, it means when you print this kind of design, you don't need any support structure, and uh, it's easy for you to get out of the powder. Then I will try to extend this method to another two subtopics. One is about the build orientation of the method. You know, in AM technology, there are many build failures, delamination, and cracks. We try to use this kind of lattice structure design methodology to help us to minimize the residual stress and find the optimal build orientations. And also, I will introduce another method called support structure design optimization method. This method basically can help us to minimize the residual stress for any given build orientations. For example, this is uh, a N plant that we printed in by using a laser powder by the fusion. If we use the traditional, let's say, all commercialized uh, support, support structure design, we'll get some large deformation after we separate the part from its substrate. But if we use this kind of functionally graded lattice structure at the support materials, 
we basically can minimize the, the distortion. You see, for these two designs, there's no heat treatment, but uh, you can see the deformation of the, the optimal one much better than the one from the block style support structure generated by the magic software. If you use the powder bite fusion, I think definitely you will know the magic software they normally use for the support structure design. So I will begin from the first first topic. So added manufacturing due to its unique capability in the fabrication of extremely complex geometries, it has begun to revolutionize the reverse fields. For example, in biomedical industrial, which, which may be one of the most uh, applicable uh, field. According to the prediction from a Holder report, in the following three years, most of the biomedical implants will be produced by powder bed fusion because it can provide a highly customized component for the disabilities, which can significantly reduce the pain of the patient. And it can significantly accelerate the deployment of this kind of implant because it, you can print locally and install it locally. AM technology is also widely used for the aerospace engineering. For example, GE has used this technology to produce the fuel nozzle, which has passed the federal aviation standard. Now in their aircraft range, they just use the component directly from AM technologies. Here's one, another sample called, I think, the sensor sample, normally used in the aircraft engine. This sample, uh, this component actually originally assembled by more than 20 to 30 uh, components. But right now, you can produce this sensor in a single process, and uh, a unibody design. The strength of this component increased more than 20%, but the weight is, at the same time is reduced more than 20%. GE also proved the AM can be used for the helicopter engine. For example, the critical components like the like the turbine blade or the nozzles can be print, printed by the laser powder by the fusion and directly installed to their aircraft engines here. So along with this application in biomedical industry and also the aerospace engineering, AM technology is also used for the development of new materials. For example, this is the material called the lattice structure. This kind of material can show negative boson ratio by precisely controlling the geometry of the microstructures. Well, we also show that the performance of the AM that it can help us to produce functionally graded porous media. This kind of porous media have very large contact surface between the cooling liquid or cooling air to the heat source, and uh, much better than other existing uh, heat transfer media here. After you introduce so many great applications, one of the big issue for AM right now is the design algorithm is still developed for the traditional manufacturing techniques. AM technology as a type of free form fabrication techniques, we definitely need some new design algorithm to leverage the potential of AM. For this concern, recently people extensively connect the temporary manipulation method to the added manufacturing. Because the manipulation method can help us achieve better structural performance through the optimization of mature distribution. It's like a kind of free form design algorithm. So then people think that this kind of free form design algorithm will be a better choice for the free form fabrication techniques like AM. So you may ask a question, are they a perfect partner between the typology of optimization method, like a free form design algorithm and AM? Unfortunately, the answer here is no. There are still some limitations from the current uh, AM technologies. For example, for the design from type of manipulation matter, it normally contains a great number of overhead structures because the structure is normally very organic. This kind of overhead structure, as highlighted by the red circle here, normally requires support structure added to anchor the whole part of the substrate. This support structure will be removed afterward. However, you know, for this kind of organic design, it's very difficult to remove the support structure in the post-processing, or very expensive to do that. If there's no support structure, here's the benchmark we printed for validation purpose. We found if you there's no support structure for some overhead features, you will get this in a web page. Or you'll get some rough surface here. For some, if the overhead feature is larger enough, you will get some build failure or collapse in these regions. Along with this overhang 
feature problem. Another problem from type of manipulation method is the include void. It can give us better performance, but it may generate some include void. This kind of include void normally needs a support structure, and also it will trip the powder like this. It's very difficult to remove those trip the powder and the support structure without damaging the, the component. If we damage the component, then the design will not far away from optimal and also it will damage the performance of the component. Based on this observation, we further ask us how can we leverage, leverage the potential of AM technology for the fabrication of a complex geometry, but at the same time to take advantage of the free form design methodology for optimal performances. For this, for this question, we give the answer like a functionally graded lattice in field optimization method. Here is a it's a video to show the method data methodology. Instead of doing solid, we do the cellular cellular structure to infill the component. Here will be a, here is a flow chart I will discuss later to show the process. The first step, we do type of to obtain the optimal density distribution by numerical simulation for a given component. All this process can be automatically achieved. After this step, we get these optimal density distributions. Then we develop a new head reconstruction framework to convert those kind of optimal density distribution to a CAD model that can be printed out for practical applications. Here's a video to show how to generate a fun functionally graded lattice structures to infill the solid component. We can actually design different volume fraction remove redundant material based on the need. Finally, we can just print a sample for proof of concept and also for practical applications. Here's a, one example we show the, how to use object machine to print the samples. For different problem, we can have different designs. This is one printed by the object machine, by the EOS machine, vendor dieting. This is by the EOS machine, sorry. We have to hear some industrial partners for this project. This project is supported by American Mix. Now I will give more details about this data methodology. Here's the flow chart that I, that I showed at the beginning of the video. For a given component, normally we use solid components like metals, and we, this kind of component will have its working conditions. We think like a boundary condition. Then we give this condition to the algorithm, do a homogenization first, then we get the optimal density distribution, then do a reconstruction, we do a validation, numerically. Finally, we can direct the principal part for practical applications. For this uh, data algorithm, I have pro proposed and programmed two software, one is the optimization software, one is the CAD software, to automatically generate the part for applications. So this process now can be automatically achieved. And uh, the program and the software have been implemented into the into ANSYS product. And uh, if you are interested in you definitely can use ANSYS package to do your lattice in field design. We, uh, we collaborate with some uh, company like Aerotech to do the practical design. This is a mirror system used by, uh, developed by the Aerotech. Basically, by using the proposed methodology, we want to remove a lot of weight from the original design. For example, this is a cell used to hold the mirror. Without changing the original shape, we basically infill the mirror, uh, this cell with the functional graded lattice structures, remove more than 50% materials. This is the base used to hold the two motors here. We can also remove a lot of materials by changing the density distribution and the, and the function node, the material property at different locations. So there are two major advantages of this framework. First, it can help us to achieve the optimal performances. For example, better energy absorption uh, better heat transfer, uh, but at the same time, they can provide the self support features. For example, this lattice structure can be printed out without any support structures. 
So thus, you, you don't need to worry about a large overhead and support structure for that. And the second one, this kind of data algorithm can reserve the original shape of the solid component. This will provide a lot of advantages for the traditional data. So here, I would like to give a little bit more details about the technical perspective. So there are three major steps for this data algorithm. The first step is what we call the homogenization. For a given lattice structure, if we want to analyze its performances, we normally need to mesh the whole unit cell. For this kind of unit cell, we may need a, a great number of elements or meshes to get a detailed description. However, this kind of mesh is super expensive. So to solve the problem, we propose homogeneous model using a solid material, which have the equivalent property to this lattice structures to do the description of the mechanical properties or heat transfer properties. Once we got this kind of homogeneous model, we implement the homogeneous model into the topology mediation method. Using the topology mediation method to find the optimal density distribution of these lattice structures. Here you can see, since we use the homogeneous model, there's no detailed geometry information, but we get still get the properties accurately. After we get this kind of optimal density distributions, we do a typology reconstruction. Here we develop another method to convert this kind of optimal density density distribution back to a variable density lattice structure data. This can data can add some constraint. For example, the minimal features can be printable, and then we can get a component for the practical production. Here, are, here we have two major contributions. First, for this kind of homogenization, it's normally used for the description of a uniform lattice structures. However, you know it's impossible for very expensive computational cost. But for gradient material, people have not do any validation. Here we prove that this type of homogenization model can be extended to the gradient material. This framework eliminates the need to explicitly model lattice structures that is possible for Pascal problem. I've extensively extended this framework to different problems like minimal compliance, constraint stress, natural frequency, convective cooling, and also combined thermal structure problem. Today I will use two of them to show the performance of this model. The first step is to achieve the homogenization of the structures. Take this cubic lattice structure as an example. For the mechanical analysis, we need an elastic constant. Cubic lattice structure has three elastic constants, C11, C12, and C44. We only do the representative volume element analysis for this unit cell and study the relationship between this elastic constant with respect to the relative density. We get these functions. This we call the homogenization model. For this homogenous model, we do experiment to see if the model agree well with the experiment. Here we print a dog bone with the lattice structure in between, then do the tensile test, see the elastic constant. And we can see this solid line basically is the homogenization model, while the red dot is the experimental result. We got pretty good agreement that we think the proposed homogenous model is accurate enough to, for the description, description of the lattice structure printed by the powder by the fusion. So this is just for uniform lattice structure. We want to see if the homogeneous model can be extended to gradient material. For this purpose, we use this cube structures for the validation purpose. For this cube, we have a, have a loading assigned on the top surface, while the fixed boundary condition is subjected to the bottom surface. In between, we have a lattice infill. Here, we have studied two different types of gradient. For the first one is the linear gradient, in which the density of the domain is linearly increased from the bottom to the top surface. This is the homogenized model. This is the corresponding lattice infill model. We also do the nonlinear material distributions. For example, this is a corresponding material distribution. This is a mature in the homogenized model. This is the one we do the reconstruction for variable density lattice structures. Then we want to see the performance of this homogenized model compared with the high fidelity simulation. Here's the result for the linear density result. For this one, it's the displacement. This is a corresponding model we use more than one million element. Well, for this one, we just use a couple thousand element. You can see the 
for the maximum displacement of the area is about 1%. Well, this is the corresponding stress. For the maximum vomited stress, the area is about 3%. Thus, we can see that this kind of homotopy model can be extend to, extended at least to this linear gradient materials. Here is the result for the nonlinear density distributions. This is the displacement. This is the displacement obtained by the homotopy model. This is the vomitic stress by the high fidelity simulation model. This is the corresponding homogenize the vomitic stress. You can see both the maximum displacement and the vomitic stress, we get a relative smaller error. Thus, through this numerical example, we see that this kind of homogenization model can be extended to gradient materials. Thus, we get some confidence for the optimization perspective. Then we begin to do the data optimization. So for aerospace applications, there's one important problem people are very interested in. For example, if I want to remove as much material as possible, but still make sure that my components work in a safe zone, that's one critical issue people are interested in. Then we propose a mass minimization under maximum stress constraint. Here is the optimization statement. The objective function is the overall volume. We want to minimize that overall volume. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the maximum stress of the component below the yield stress. We take this aerospace component as an example. This is the loading load bearing component. We add a vertical loading to the Z direction, which is 47 kilonewtons. And the, the material for this component is the Intel 718, which Young's, which Young's model is about 200 gigapascal, while the yield strength is about 810 megapascal. Without any optimization, we can see the maximum stress. It's about 372 megapascal, nearly half of the yield strength, which means we have enough room to remove a material from this solid design. Then we use the proposed optimization method to infill this solid component with functionally graded lattice structures and print it out for testing purpose. After optimization, we can remove more than 53% material from the solid design, reserve the original shape, and uh, then we can do the testing using the same conditions. Here, we first do the simulation model. We call it high fidelity simulation for all the lattice structures here. You can see the maximum stress is increased from 372 to 757, still below the yield stress, which is 810 megapascal. Thus, we think our requirement is satisfied which means the constraint is satisfied. The bottom right corner provides the corresponding uh, density distribution of lattice structures. You can see more material actually deposited around the boat hole region. This actually makes sense because we have high stress concentration around these regions. If we have more material, it's getting stronger. While for other regions, we get uh, less density here. Then we do the testing. Here's the experiment testing for this component. The experiment is done by UTRC. The top right corner provided the corresponding loading displacement curve. In this curve, basically, you can see the dashed line is the predefined loading, 47 kilonewtons. This is solid line from the experiment measurement. You can see below this dashed line, we get a linear relationship, which means all the components that work in the safe zone Above this dashed line a little bit, we get nonlinear relationship. We can see the classical deformation. Thus, we can see how from experiment, the predefined constraint is satisfied, and we remove more than 50% materials. Additionally, we also attach three, uh, three sensors on the 0 degree, 45 degree, and 90 degree to see the mirror string compared to the prediction from the model. You can see this is the comparison. We get pretty good agreement, which means the proposed homogenous model and also the optimization can give us pretty good prediction for the performance and also the minimization of the mass of the overall component. Then I would like to discuss a second optimization for by using this framework 
for, especially for heat transfer. Actually, the lattice structure have a great potential to further improve the heat transfer of a given system. For this purpose, the, here's the optimization statement. The objective function, basically, we want to maximize the heat transfer of the whole device, which actually can also see as like minimization the negative value of heat transfer of a whole system. That's why we add a negative stand here. Here are the governing equations for the heat transfer problem. I will not come to the details. Here, we want to specify a couple of things here. This is a continuum equation. This is a momentum equation. This is a heat transfer for solid and liquid. Specifically, we propose three homogeneous models to describe the effective soft-term conductivity convective cooling coefficient for the conductive structures. And then we add also the volume fraction as a constant for the given problem. This is optimization statement, statement can be used for any heat transfer problem that we are interested in. Here, we use a jet impingement cooling system as one example. For this system, we have cooling air in the come out, coming in at the edge of the top surface. While bottom surface, we have a heat flux, and then the cooling air come out from the left side of the device. Here, we try to try two different types of materials: the inclined 718 and the aluminum alloy. The volume fraction of the device we will we will assume is about 50%. And uh, here are the optimal design for two different materials. The results are actually very interesting. For aluminum alloy, the optimization tend to add more material to the bottom surface and generate a large contact surface between the bottom surface and also the inlet cooling air. While for the ink 718, the optimization tend to directly generate a cooling channel, you can see, from the inlet to the bottom surface where the heat flux boundary condition is assigned. This result actually makes sense. Since the thermal conductivity of the aluminum alloy is much higher than the ink now 718, 5 to 10 times larger. Thus, for aluminum alloy, it's better to generate a larger contact surface between the heat flux boundary condition and also the in in cooling air. Well, for ink now 718, for the relative small thermal conductivity, it's better to directly use the cooling air to remove the heat on the bottom surface. So this kind of result shows that the proposed methodology can optimize the performance for given materials based on its properties. Here are some results for Inknel 718. This is a homogenization model for the temperature prediction. You can see before the optimization, use the same uniform the structure, the maximum temperature about 253 degrees Celsius, while the difference between maximum value and smaller value is over 133 degrees Celsius. While for the, after the optimization, the maximum temperature is reduced to about 100 degrees Celsius, while the difference between maximum value and smaller value is about 10 degrees Celsius, represented more than 10 times difference here. Then we, do the reconstruction of the data and print it out for testing purpose. Here's the CAD model generated by the reconstruction algorithm. This is just one print out for testing. We drill some bolt holes uh, to fix everything to a experimental, a, a, a experimental apparatus. Here's the experimental setup. This setup is built up by UTRC and uh, we have top top piece, media, and bottom piece. For the bottom piece, we use to ascend the heat flux at the bottom surface of the sample. This is the inlet, this is the outlet. Well, the top piece will have a, a, a line of holes to add, a, uh, air, add a, that, that kind of air inlet cooling air for the system will come into here and come out from here. And then we use thermal couple to measure the temperature. Here's the result. For comparison purpose, we also print another design with the same volume of same mass as the optimal design. For example, 50% optimal design, 50% 50, 50 uniform design. This one shows the result of the wall mean wall temperature between the prediction by the model and also the experimental measurement. This black dot actually is the model prediction. We get a relative good agreement here. Uh, error is about 20%. For heat transfer, 20% is, 
it's a it's a acceptable acceptable result. This is the one show the maximum work temperature with respect for different heat flux. For the same heat flux, basically you can see the optimal design is much smaller than the uniform design, which means without any optimization. For example, take this one as an example, the temperature is reduced from more than 60 to around 40, represent more than 30% reduction. And also, if you further increase the heat flux, the the temperature will be much slow, smaller than the of the optimal, but optimal one will be much smaller than the uniform design. So the last image here shows the pressure drop for the same Reynolds number. The pressure drop of the uniform design is much higher than optimal design, which actually basically means if we can use less energy but get much better heat transfer performances here. So through these two examples, I basically want to show if we can have a better design algorithm, we can leverage the potential of AM technology for this kind of heat transfer applications. So after discuss the functional grid and lattice structure optimization, I would like to discuss another two subtopics here. These two subtopics -top also relate to lattice structures, but uh, we try to use this kind of design algorithm to address the critical problem in Metal AM, for example, residual stress accumulation and also the build failure. I will introduce them one by one here. So before the introduction of the algorithm, I would like to show some images that we encountered in the lab. So here is a dog bone we try to print out a tensor test. Unfortunately, after four hours of build, the residual stress killed out the samples from its substrate and stopped the powder deposition process. Then we have this kind of build failure. If we want to print the dog bone, we need to redesign and do a trial and error, see which build direction will be better for the residual stress minimization. But it's very tough to do. Sometimes it seems everything is successfully printed. For example, these two components. But after we take out everything from the substrate, we found these cracks, and also these delaminations. This because everything is sink into the metal powder. You cannot you cannot know the cracks before you move everything from the substrate. So this actually we all we be, belong to this can kind of build failures. So this build failures. It's very tough to handle for metal AM. So you may ask a question, what should we do for, for engineers? So for engineers, if you they have many experience about build failures, they may gain some sense how to place uh, samples, how to find the next build orientations to guarantee the manufacturability of the design. For example, we, we all know that for this kind of dog bone, if we print everything in a horizontal way, we get these cracks. But if we print the dog bone in a vertical way, oh, we can success print the dog bones. But for some complex geometry like this one, it's very difficult for the engineers to find a nice build orientation and support structure data at the first time to make sure the sample can be printed by using the data pattern by the theorem. Sometimes you get a build failure after 98% is finished. So consider this problem. We try to reduce the trial and error process to see if we can develop method to solve this problem. However, there are several technical barrier, barriers that prevent us to develop an uh, algorithm to solve this problem. So the first one is that if we want to find an optimal build orientation, we need to rotate the part in the build space. Every time if we change the build orientation, the support structure will be changed accordingly. So the, how to efficiently detect the support structure and generate the mesh from a simulation perspective is a critical problem. Second, from an optimization per perspective, for a general optimization, it normally requires 50 to 300 iterations. In each iteration, we need to evaluate the performance of the data. If we do simulation at each iteration, it will be very expensive. For example, the current AM simulation takes about hour to days if you do thermal mechanical simulation. 
For Pascal, it's impossible to do optimization. Keep this in mind, we try to develop a method to overcome these barriers one by one. The first one is a mesh generation. So I did then a benchmark which the case one, case three, and case four need support structure. For case two, all the overhead surface satisfied overhead angle constraint. But for three and four, you have overhead edge and overhead point. I tried the existing method. I first tried a paper published in 2015. It tends to generate a support structure for all the overhead features. You can see something like this. The right means the support structures. If you support all the undercut surface here, so it will be very difficult for you to remove the support structures. Then in another paper, people only find the overhead fitted. It's fun to find overhead fitted, but ignore the overhead edge and offer overhead point. So to solve this problem, we propose a methodology which can help us automatically identify the overhead fitted, overhead edge, and overhead point, and add a support structure under the nurse stem. Then we try this method for the complex geometry. You can see for this aerospace component, if I use the existing method like conformal mesh, it will be very expensive to generate support structures. We can only get the component. But if we use voxel-based mesh in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion, they can quickly generate the mesh for both the part and its support structures. For example, this component for one million voxel, it only takes two seconds with my laptop. Then we solve the first barrier, the mesh generation and the overhead detection. The second problem, if we want to optimize the build orientation of support structure, we need a efficient simulation model. So then we take a look at the fabrication process. Suppose this is a laser beam. We see if the laser melts the powder, we first get a thermal expansion. After the laser scans some region, this region will be cooling down. When it's cooling down, we'll get thermal contraction. So the residual stress is accumulated during this thermal expansion and thermal contraction process. Then we think, is that possible? We propose some method to simplify the physics and make it faster for the prediction of residual stress. For this purpose, we propose a enhanced stream method. It's a multi-scale method for AM simulation. At a small scale, we do thermal mechanical analysis to see what the deformation and the residual stress looks like. Then we extract the enhanced stream. After that, we assign the enhanced stream to a component through the voxel mesh in a layer by layer fashion, we can achieve the residual stress. You can see through this multi scale model, we simplify the thermal mechanical analysis to a poor static analysis, much cheaper, much faster. Then you want to know the accuracy, right? So for the for validation purpose, we print a benchmark sample called double cantilever beam. For this double cantilever beam, after the fabrication, we separate this beam, the T-beam, from its support structure, and then measure the distortion of the top, top surface here. This is the corresponding measurement. This is the simulation result. But compared with the simulation, we can find that the experiment agree well with the simulation, which means the simulation model can help us accurately capture the distortion for the as built samples. The most important part is that through this simulation model, we simplify the thermal mechanical analysis to static, static analysis. The computational cost is reduced from hours to minutes level. That is possible to do optimization. The first thing we think is the build orientation optimization. This may be the most popular steps people use to minimize the residual stress. Let's take this bearing bracket as an example. We basically normally rotate the part along either X or Y axis here. For this purpose, we set we set our object function as the maximum volumetric stress. Well, this is a corresponding enhanced matter to help us get a stress distribution. So this is the samples we first build with the block style support structure from commercial software like the Magix. As I mentioned, we get some delamination at the bottom surface. We think maybe we can change this kind of block style support structure as lattice structure to solve the problem. Then you can see we try the lattice structure at the, at the beginning. We still get some cracks here, 
for weak tricubic, diagonal, and cross. They all get some cracks. But we can see, compared with this block style support structure, this kind of lattice structure shows much better stress than the block style support structure because it's open cell, the heat transfer will be better. So the stress accumulation will become smaller. But we still get some cracks, which means we need to find a build orientation to minimize that value. So here we first try to do the optimization for the cubic lattice structure. After optimization, you can see the maximum residual stress. Here, all the stress is normalized by the yield stress. So one means yield stress. For this cubic lattice structure, we basically can optimize the residual stress from 1.56 1 to around below 1.1, 1 .1, close to 1, which means very close to the yield stress. Thus, at least we think it maybe can successfully print it. So this is the corresponding orientation after the optimization. We also do the build orientation optimization method for the another lattice, two lattice structure, cross and diagonal. We can see for the for the diagonal, the maximum residual stress is reduced below one, which means it definitely it can be successfully printed. Well, for the cross, we still a little bit upper than the 1.15 which means we may have some problem for the printing. But uh, definitely from this three lattice structure and the optimization process, you can see the methodology can help us reduce the residual stress. So that is orientation optimization works. Then we print them on the same substrate. We successfully build the samples on the substrate at once. No cracks, no delaminations, no observed large distortions. You can see all of them is successfully built it here. So this example, I see the build, I want to show that the build orientation of this matter can help us to minimize the residual stress, but we can still get some problem possible you know, for different, pro, different designs because still over the residual stress, over the yield stress. So based on this observation, we further propose another matter to make sure that the maximum residual stress below the yield stress, definitely we can guarantee the manufacturability of, of the design. So this is a, a like the kind of figure to show the general uh, printing process for components. For the, for example, suppose we have a solid component, we have a substrate, we have a supposed structure in between. So in order to guarantee the manufacturability, we want to make sure the stress within a part and also it's supposed to structure below the yield stress. Then we need need a constraint to, to do that. And then we add a object function like our constraint stress problem. We want to minimize the material within the supposed structure region. So you can see this is an optimization problem. Because supposed structure is a, a kind of waste material, we want we will throw them away afterwards. So the less the better. That's why we per, define this objective function. So we first use this cantilever, double cantilever beam as one example. So you can see the double cantilever beam have two support here. We want to design support structure in this region. Before the before we design support structure, we first use a uniform lattice structure. We get the stress above one. Basically, you can see 1.1. 1 .1. Then we do the optimization the maximum residual stress is reduced below one, which means it can be successfully printed out. This is the material distribution in the supposed structure region. After optimization, you got the three structures. It will anchor everything to the substrate. The maximum residual stress is only observed between the solid part and the substrate. Then we try to do experiment to see the performance. Unfortunately, the first build is failed. The reason is that we try to print four different type of support structure and do the comparison. But the support structure from the block style one by the metric software just get some delamination and then stop the powder deposition process. Then we get this build failure. To further do the comparison, we remove the block style support structure and keep another three. T support structure, optimal lattice structure, support structure, and also the same volume fraction, uniform lattice structure. 
as a support. All these three are successfully built, but for the T support, definitely you can see some delaminations. While for another two, there's no cracks or delaminations. Then we separate the double cantilever beam from its support structure and the mirror the distortion of the top surface. You can see the optimal one definitely show the smallest distortion compared with the uniform lattice structure and also T support structure, which means the constraint stress of the method can help us significantly reduce the residual stress accumulated during the printing process. So, so I get one question. Let me maybe let me finish, and then we can go through the question one by one. So we also try to use this method for the real world problem. For example, this is a, this is an implant we printed out for our collaborators. Unfortunately, the first build it failed. We get some cracks here, which means we get a large deformation for the part. So. We want to minimize that deformation. And for example, we, if we do some heat treatment, definitely we can remove the residual stress. But that's all based on the successful build. If they, we get such a distortion, there's no way you can do heat treatment to re remove the residual stress. Here we do the support structure for three different build orientations, which means 0 degree, 45, and 90 degree. We want to see the performance of the proposed methodology for different build orientations. You know, sometimes if you have a component for some region, you do not want to add the support structures. Then you have a specific requirement for the build orientations. If you have a specific requirement for the build orientation, there may be a high residual stress. But now if you can optimize the support structure, then definitely you can minimize the residual stress. That's the purpose of this kind of support structure optimization. You can see after optimization, the maximum residual stress all reduced below the yield stress from 3.1, 2.4, 2, 2.1, 2, 2, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, which means we can successfully finish the fabrication. So here's the result. After the build, we can successfully build these three build orientations without ob uh, observe the cracks or uh, deformations. You can see these samples at a different, uh, different different views, and we only build once, no actual build. So through this example, I want to basically show this methodology can also be extended to this kind of practical problem. So then I would like to make a conclusion about the. Uh, the presentation today. First, we propose a functional gradient lattice infill optimization method. And uh, to optimize the gradient of lattice structure, we develop a homogeneous model and uh, extend it to the gradient mature description. We have proved that this kind of homogenization based optimization method can be efficiently used for the optimization of gradient materials. And also, a homogeneous model can be able to actually describe the thermal and the mechanical property of gradient lattice structures. After that, we try to extend this kind of homogeneous model and the optimization to the support structure design and the build orientation optimization to re reduce or minimize the residual stress. We can find that for the build orientation of management matter, it can help us to reduce 30 to 50% residual stress. While for the support structure of medicine, the reduction is about 50 to 70%. Through so this example, I show by properly design the support structure. Basically, you can save a lot of efforts for the build orientation, trial and error procedure, and also the residual stress problem that you encountered for your problem. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the my former group member and also my collaborators. And also the funding sponsored from American Mix and the collaborate uh, experimental support from Aerotech, UTRC, NCSG, and the Alcor. Thanks for your attention. Now I'm very happy to answer any question here. All right, thank you, Lynn. Great presentation. Uh, we'll now head into the Q and A session. Um, like I said earlier, if you have a question for our presenter and you have not done so already, please type it into the chat box. Um, I have a few questions here to uh, get started with. So um, let's see, we've got one here. Have you done any work to look at how lattice structures 
uh, interact with with thin walls where they meet thin walls or, or boundaries? Uh, not yet, not yet. We only yeah. So we will add the thin walls after we do a latent structure deep then. So we didn't do some testing for the thin walls. So you mean the thin walls? How thin the wall? You you mean? Um. I I don't, there's no detail there. I know that we have other projects with with OSU and and you know others other members that are looking into those things. So it might be be worth, uh, might be worth you know a a, a chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible to do that. Yeah, but we didn't do that those kind of testing. Yeah, we basically just infill the solid component with lattice structure, and add a thin scan to some region that uh, have have you know broken ligament. Okay. All right, thank you. Let's see over now to the next question. Um, isn't it over designing when optimizing support structure to have stress below yield strength as failure starts at ultimate strength? That's a good question. So we actually try to over design a little bit. That's why we use the yield strength because you know for the ultimate strength, you still may have some problem for build failure. But for yield strength, definitely is there's no build failure here. Yeah, that's a good, I think a good point. Uh, we can definitely try the ultimate strength as a, you know, constraint to minimize the residual stress. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, we have a, we have a attendee who has requested to uh, be unmuted so they can ask their question. Let's see if I can make that happen. Okay, go ahead. Uh, is it Sequeep? You go ahead and ask your question if you'd like to. Okay, so Professor Lin, uh, uh, basically, uh, right now I'm working uh, as a research intern under under a professor. So I am working on designing a honeycomb lattice structure. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that honeycomb lattice structure, we are basically working on making it more complex with adding the hierarchy. So uh, if you will uh, get me, like for uh, the point where three edges are joining, uh, that's a node, right? Mm -hmm. So at that node, we are adding a honey uh, hexagonal prism. And in that hexagonal prism, we are adding one more hierarchy with adding mm -hmm. uh, hexagonal prism in that node also. So uh, right now I have to design that hexagonal prism. And at the last, we will be having a seven uh, hierarchy state, like seventh order hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, like, would you suggest me some, uh, like, would you suggest me the software uh, which would be preferred for designing that? Right now I'm uh, designing it on Fusion 360, but it is lagging uh, yeah. uh, in the... Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Actually, it's very expensive to use the CAD model to design this kind of lattice structure. So, because lattice, uh, this kind of uh, CAD model is normally based on NURBS. So, to do that, NURBS basically do the everything explicitly. They have a NURBS function to do that. If you want to do very complex lattice structure, I will suppose the implicit way to represent the lattice structure. You can use a software like the Entopology. They use the you know, level set method to describe the lattice structure. It's very efficient, much cheaper, and also you know robust for complex geometries. OK, sir. And it's Entopology and? Yeah, Entopology, yeah. OK. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your question. Yeah, I, I can tap the name of the software in the chat. Great. Thank you, Len. Yeah. All right. I know we got another question um, about, I think, let's see. Can we please get a recording of this session? Yeah, Alex, um, we did record the session, and it will be posted to the America Makes YouTube channel. Uh, and we will also post it to the America Makes website. So if you would, uh, if you want, you can go to either of those places and, and see it. Uh, we'll probably have it up, you know, by the end of this week. Okay, and I think we got a couple more questions here. We got a couple more minutes. So let's see. I may have missed this part of the conversation, but did you say that heat dissip dissipation was improved with the AM structure? If so, could you please explain why that is? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, if we use the lattice structure, you will have a lack of pulse media, right? It will basically change the flow channels within the domain. If you optimize the flow channels, you will get 
different performance for the heat transfer, right? For some reason, you need a high velocity, you have a small holes. For some reason, you have a larger holes. So through optimization of lattice drive next to the relative density, you can change the hole size. And then, then we also change the whole flow field. The flow field will respond for the heat transfer. So this is a way how we you know, improve the heat transfer, optimize the lattice drive density, change the flow field, and then change the heat transfer at different locations. Does that answer your question? All right. Let's see. So there was a there was another part of that. Uh, when comparing the lattice structure used, what indices did you consider aside relative density? Uh, for this research, basically we have sixteen different lattice structures. We we only consider relative density at this moment, but it's possible to also consider the pattern of lattice structure. For example. One location I use cubic lattice structure, another location I use cross lattice structure or diagonal lattice structure, it's possible to do that. All right, thanks. I think that actually answered another question we got. Were other unit cell geometries explored for this study? Yeah, if you go to ANSYS uh, software package like Workbench, they, they've already implemented this you know, did the algorithm in their software package. You you have, uh, I think, more than 16 different lattice structures as a, you know, candidates for your design. All right, great, thank you very much. Let's see, I think that's all the questions we have today. So let's see, if you have any more and you wanna get them in quickly, we do have a couple more minutes, but I think that's gonna wrap up today's TRX webinar series. I would like to once again, thank Lynn. Lynn, that was a great presentation. Uh, you know, very, very interesting, good stuff. Uh, if yeah. you have sex for your, uh, for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Anytime. Uh, if you have further questions for Lynn, uh, you can reach out to him directly His his contact information is here on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, there right. will be a post webinar survey going out to all of those who participated today. We really do appreciate the time that you take to provide America makes feedback so that we may continue to improve and strengthen the additive community. All right, and then just as a, a reminder, if you think that you or your organization would be interested in sharing in a TRX webinar series, please fill out the form that follows the presentation, or you can reach out to me, Jason Thomas, directly at jason.thomas at ncdmm.org. Once again, thanks, Lynn, for the great presentation today. Thank you all our attendees for joining us, and uh, that's going to wrap up the series. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. All right, thanks, Lynn. Have a good day. Everyone have a great afternoon. You too. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone.